Well, if you did a, a quick rewind, you would say 30 years ago, there's just, I had people say to me, there was no Māori presence that I'm aware of in Christchurch City. So you've got a very uh, almost non existent um, uh, aw- consciousness or awareness in Christchurch if, if the Māori dimension, the Tangata Whenua, the indigenous uh, rights and interests in the city. You fast forward through this decade, two decades of treaty settlement process, the Waitangi Act, the Waitangi Tribunal, presentation of a claim, all the stuff and the angst that goes with that as a country as we grappled with what on earth does this mean. Uh, the settling down of that, this is all an emergence of a conversation. People work out, hey, there are, there is an Indigenous community here, there are things to think about and worry about, and you get NITO settlement, which in turn throws up all sorts of relationships, let's say, between ni- local NITO communities and the Fish and Game Council to do with harvesting birds on Moihora, Lake Ellesmere. So all of, across this time you're getting conversations started, you're getting alliances built, common interests established, and there's a bit of a rhythm going. Naito, whose uh, institutions are growing, investment capacity and investment presence in the city is growing, all the way up to uh, uh, Christchurch City Council and Naito building jointly the city's civic centre. So there's a real emblem of a community finding each other and starting to come together. Um, then we're all bumped on our backside by an earthquake pretty evenly, bang, all bets are off, uh, start again, and we do get the imposition of these, this really powerful, uh, the, the SERA Act, uh, the legislation that g- gives these very considerable powers to the, the government through ministers to do the things needed to get us back on our feet. And that piece of legislation formally writes in NITO's authority to be involved in conversations, to be consulted, to be involved in decision-making processes uh, all the way through, um, uh, through a whole number of aspects of the um, earthquake recovery and, and the rebuild uh, process. So now you've got NITO formally at law with rights in these processes and the city's really, in the broader sense, has really had to work out what that means. In the same way that NITO's had to work out what does that mean. Gee, we've now got to turn up at this meeting, that meeting, the other meeting, talk about sewage infrastructure, investment, uh, landscaping, artistic stuff. Where does all that stuff come from? How are we going to organise ourselves? So a big challenge both ways, really, at the time of earthquake. So the earthquake was a shock in more ways than one, but really did open up a space here, which we've all been filling variously as we've been able to work it out um, since. It was a unique opportunity here. Hmm. And, And I've always thought the question is, it's like you go into a forest and you get a pot of gold, you know? And the real challenge is take the pot of gold out of the forest before it turns to ash. And, and that's always about capacity to take what people imagine could be and then to give it form and function in, in daylight. And that always comes down to capacity. And mm. I think, in retrospect, you know, taking a back view at it, the tribe's capacity was limited, but also um, the Crown and Christ <coughs> and mm. the general capacity within New Zealand to go the extra distance is always limited by what you've got in front of you. So how did you organise yourself, given the Crown organised itself with a very much of a command and control model? What happens internally at Ngātahu at this time when you're learning to respond? And Probably, in truth, no different from the Crown. It's been fascinating to watch Parkia politics in Christchurch. And um, I've learnt a lot about Christchurch politics and its re- relationship with the Crown. There's always the tensions between the central mm. office in Wellington or the command and control. But was it really command and control? I'm not, I'm not sure that it was. It was probably closer. Everyone was scrambling around trying to make the best of the situation. It's interesting, I mean, you could describe the, the powers that Brownlee had as command and control, but but what I've noticed mm-hmm. about the Christchurch people in Canterbury is they do have a tendency to wander aimlessly nowhere, <laughs> which requires command and control. The situation with ECAN and, and mm. the utter inability of Christchurch and the community before the before it to go ahead with any mm. sense of cohesion, mm. my view was absolutely um, stunning. Um, because if you knew the, the politics of Christchurch, with if you knew the politics of Christchurch beforehand and mm. the disaster that really unfolded during the next term of the Christchurch City Council, you needed command and control. 
So we weren't, we we weren't very well placed to have an earthquake. No, no not, not the top of our game prior, that's right. So internally at Natahu, yeah. when you say it's probably not a lot different to the command and control of the Crown. Well, there's a central office. <clears throat> Um, and clearly the, the Canterbury, sorry, the Runinga, the villages are the points of authority. But the central office believes itself to be because it has the monopoly of politics and resources. So, th but those tensions between the village centres and the tribal corporation is no different from Christchurch mm. and Wellington. But, you know, I found that the workings of the Christchurch community, fascinating to watch. And the oligarchies inside. And mm. let's not fool ourselves that the tendering processes or anything else were based on merit. Mm. Um, the, the whole makeup of Sarah and the bureaucracies, you could pretty much put your blocks of relationships there. There's, there was certainly a command and control, you know, to use your words, but there was a strong military presence in Sarah. Um, there was a strong Canterbury families presence there to the exclusion of a lot of other, mm. you know. <clears throat> so the internal mm. workings, I, I used mm. to watch it in, mm. inside and I was <laughs> amazed at how the Parkia community takes its own nepotism for granted. Mm. <laughs> How about the the oligarchies inside Naitahu? Would you like similar? Yep. So human politics does what human politics does, and it, it doesn't matter whether you put it in the Naitahu uh, <laughs> structural box or a Christchurch City Council or wider Christchurch City box. So it's all about relationships and power politics and ideology and who's got the authority to have their point win in the circumstances. And so these are both dynamic communities. Mm. And what's interesting here is you've got two already dynamic communities bumping into each other in a time mm. of um, a particular crisis and, and need. So it's a real test of both. I'd like to ask you, Anaki, about your position was part of the um, Sarah check model. I don't know what you call uh, right, that. Right, so... Um, uh, yes, so I, I formerly had a role as NITO's Chief Executive Officer um, and was in that role at the time of the earthquake. Um, I was on that position, retired from that position in maybe 2011, uh, which is about the point that the Sarah Review Panel uh, was being established. So four people who sit across these decisions which cut across administrative law, really. You, you might want to shortcut the RMA just for reasons of expediency in the city rebuild. So I've the privilege of being on that panel. And so we got to see the exceptional asks would come past as recommendations. Uh, we'd review them, make comment, and then forward them on to Minister Brownlee, uh, who would then use his authorities under Sierra legislation to, uh, to affect things by decree, basically. So you've got to clean up an awful mess. Uh, this is a war zone and there's just broken buildings everywhere and uh, so the bulldozers came in and that job was done pretty ruthlessly, pretty brutally and I get the criticism about did that last heritage building need to go down and were, were these processes uh, uh, just too draconian? Take that edge off, the job needs to be done and I think it's a, I'd give it a very strong, you know, there's, there's an A mark uh, um, for, for the clean up bit of this. It, 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 we had to get through that and it was pretty thankless, and you were never going to make any friends at it. Um, then you get into the what do we do next stage, and I really, um, I'm less enamoured with the command and control mechanism the way it's played. I was surprised at how um, vigorously and constructively the community, despite the fact it was the, sort of the day after, stepped up into the share idea, share an idea sort of campaign. What's the city that you would like in the future, despite the fact your house is still leaking and so on? Mm -hmm. And I thought a, um, a remarkably clear image of something that's environmentally connected, uh, which is more uh, integrated and inclusive, a society that's more uh, concerned about the climate change issues, energy, self-reliance and so on. There were various ideas that I, I thought was really credible. Mm. And I think, and this isn't picking on any particular individual, but I think the structures that are central government structures, they're not built for authentic <coughs> community. Mm. Um, uh, disclosure, finding of the community rhythm and voice and building on that because the, those structures are all about um, command and control for good, it's a military analogy with reason, but it's also about low risk. You, you don't risk uh, ministers' reputations or profiles or the government of the day or they're not built to do what we needed which was surface a community view 
um, from a pretty weak background, as Tamari's quite correctly referenced, I think. And I, as an individual, I feel that all that authority was sucked out of this community. It was sort of, just go back into your house and uh, we'll tell you when it's safe to come out. And a lot of decisions have been made unilaterally from uh, afar and they've been sort of not negotiable because the resources have been behind them. This institution, the University of Canterbury, one quarter of a billion dollars worth of damage, so that's a lot of leverage. That's a lot of central government leverage on the direction that this university takes because they've got the checkbook. And it's, um, <coughs> that's been applied pretty um, uh, mm. clearly. Pretty, well, with, with, uh, um, well, I think that the, 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 the power has been used for purpose. The, and ideology, if you want to use that word, has, so these decisions have been taken from that frame. Mm. And that's in a way weakened the voice of this community. Because I think, ironically, we're rebuilding the past. Um, we're re rebuilding past architectural models, uh, past technologies. Mm. We're replicating the city of last century. And there's a, uh, there's a real irony to this in that Christchurch, that got all its old infrastructure removed for free, mm. uh, got this on a plate. We've squandered that opportunity and we're rebuilding, uh, rebuilding um, last century's approach where even the oldest cities, of the, the, the Londons and the New Yorks and the Parises, uh, the San Francisco's are running electric buses, biofuel buses, um, locally produced and reticulated solar energy in New York City. Uh, Paris has got their renter cars in the same way that we, and this, we've, we've walked right past that. And I, I think that's the opportunity. I think that's the price we've paid for this um, command and control run from Wellington sort of approach. And I think the, it, this doesn't take away from the point that Tamari quite rightly made is that Pre-earthquake, we weren't, we weren't built for this challenge as a city. We weren't up for that ask at all. Uh, that takes time to rectify. So I, I think as a community, we're really, really going to back our own council and take ownership of this debate ourselves and reclaim as much of the opportunity that's left, because a lot of concrete's been poured in this last five years. Uh, we are foreclosing these opportunities to have a precinct, which is, I don't know, what, are, what about a precinct of the future? Uh, what might that look like? We know where we're going. It's going to be low energy, zero carbon, and we've got to work out how to get there fast. Why wouldn't we, with institutions like this university and CRIs and so on, go there? I think it's the millennial group that I'll be backing. People miss the point. They're already just about the majority of the workforce, uh, this high value um, uh, cohort. And one thing that really interests me, and I do tease my former employer about this, uh, is where's the NITO voice? in that future space. How is NITO claiming that bit of articulating what that future might be and how does it invest its now considerable resources, and I'm not just thinking financial, but leverage statutory authority and so on to help frame that. And I, I think that's, again, one of the big opportunities that we've got. And the jury's out, really, as a, as a community about it, how clearly we're going to grab that and how much we're going to own it in our own name. The tribe and, and home and the, the Canterbury, sorry, Tuahiwi and the Canterbury participants in it have tried to create a new key, a new iwi tribal identity that synthesizes with Pākehā culture. Because we've been very clear we don't want these traditional things around the city, these iconic statements of what you assume to be Māori. Because they'll mm. just juxtapose with the Pākehā community and everything else. So uh, Mata Pōpōri, the group, has tried really hard to synthesize a cultural a cultural identity that the Christchurch people will resonate with, you know, because we do like William Morris, we do like rose gardens, mm. um, and we want rose gardens because everyone at home has rose gardens. We we appreciate the settler identity and what they've brought, mm. but I've I've always felt the Christchurch people never appreciated this enough to declare it. Mm. It's very hard to tell if if government said we're now out of this. Christchurch have full election if your own environment can be back, have full authority over the resources and uh, big decisions in the city. Is Christchurch up to it? I don't know, but there's only one way we're going to find out, is have a go. It will be like these other aspects we're talking about, I think, it will be messy. We'll make mistakes and we'll have some scraps on the side and that's what communities do, but they'll be our messes, they'll be our scraps. We'll begin to know each other better as a result and we'll find these things which we are that are working and I, I think so. I think that'd be my bid. I think that we need to step up, and I th think it wouldn't be bad for the for the government to to, to step off a little. Mm -hmm.